Here. Do you know how to work this little guy? Um, I oh. Don't. oh, okay. That's easy enough. So just left and right, and then that little pointer if you need it. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, so as he said, or I guess first, thanks for hosting everything, Eric. Um, but yeah, I'm Alicia Rummel. I'm the new district conservation technician and wildlife biologist for the Gunnison Conservation District, um, replacing Brooke Vasquez, you guys might have known her. Um, and this is a really neat topic. And like Eric said, we're the conservation district is kind of piloting a test program for this technology. So that's why we have interest in it. Um, I'm not going to really talk about that pilot project. I just want to talk about the technology itself because it's a really neat thing. So just like every talk, it's really important to thank all of our partners in this pilot project. We've worked with a lot of these organizations and they've helped provide funding and logistics and all that kind of thing. So really important that we thank them to start. So a lot of you guys might be wondering even what is virtual fencing? It's not something that's talked about super commonly right now. Um, and it's basically a system of GPS collars, base stations, and software that's all integrated together to create these virtual fences. Um, so it's not a physical barrier, it's just technology that creates fencing. Um, and it's really important too that you guys understand that it's a tool just like any other tool that you might use. So um, it's not a substitute for good animal husbandry practices and good grazing management. So um, basically, it's all based on GPS collars that the cattle wear. They're solar powered, so they have quite a long lifespan, the collars themselves. Um, and you end up with an app on a smartphone or a computer or a tablet or whatever you use. Um, and in this app, you basically can draw a fence around whatever area you want. And that boundary is transmitted to a base station that's in the field. Um, and this base station then relays those boundaries to the collars on the cattle. And the base station does have to be in cellular or satellite service, um, but the collars themselves do not have to maintain service, um, which is obviously a really big deal in Gunnison. So basically, they just have to come in range of that base station. So you want to put that base station in an advantageous spot, like um, at a, a watering trough or something like that, where you know the, the cattle will be returning to. Um, or you could put it at a, a high point where it's going to really radiate that signal. Um, and then the collars will hold on to that data, and they they know where those boundaries are until you change that boundary, which is really easy to do, and you can do it any time. So the other really key piece of this is that it's all based on animal behavior. Um, and right now, all of the systems are species specific. So the company that the Conservation District is working with um, is all cattle specific. There's another company that started off, and it was um, basically goats only. And they've since progressed into cattle. But those are the only two animals I know of right now that have this technology developed. Um, and I'll start talking a little bit about um, why that is. But um, it just requires tons and tons of work on the development end for them to be able to understand the behaviors that make this technology work. Um, so that's a huge part of it. And obviously, in the long run, all of these companies want to develop it, so they have their bigger market base. Um, but for now, that's what it is. Um, so it's based on some psychology principles that you guys might have learned about long ago. Um, it's all based on operant learning and classical conditioning. So classical conditioning is the involuntary response to a neutral signal. Um, and the classic example is Pavlov's dogs. So he would ring a dinner bell and feed his dogs, and they would salivate from the food. Um, and then eventually, he would phase out the food. And just ringing the bell would produce that same involuntary response. Um, operant learning is um, where you have rewards or punishments that are used to strengthen or weaken voluntary behaviors. So that's kind of where all of this is coming from. It's the same animal training and human training principles that are used. Um, for decades now. So basically, you have a cow with a collar on it, and it approaches that virtual fence area, and it receives an audio warning. Um, 
and that's just a tone that the caller emits. And if it continues walking forward, it receives a negative electrical stimulus. And it turns out that the cows learn really, really fast not to keep walking forward when they hear that tone. And they stop moving. Um, a lot of times they'll turn around. Um, and it, from what we hear from the companies, they don't experience the stimulus very much because they learn very fast. So um, with this being a behavior-based system, it's not a hard barrier. So these are some of the diagrams that the company has put out just kind of showing a typical response or a behavior pattern that this gets or that happens after you have this system on. And so you can see um, in this, oops, never mind, I did it wrong. That part right there, you can see that some cows will cross out of the barrier every now and again. Um, but a lot of times they'll get herded back in pretty quickly. So um, if they do get out of that barrier, they'll hear that tone and then they'll get the electric st stimulus if they keep moving out. So it, it basically turns them around and sends them back into the barrier where they won't receive that stimulus anymore. Um, and the collars also have a lot of motion sensors in them and they're really, really highly refined sensors. So um, one of the ways that a, a cow might get out of the system is if it's running and the company has programmed them where a cow won't get shocked if it's if it's running and panicked, it will only receive that stimulus once it stops and then it moves forward because they don't want to promote panicked livestock. <laughs> so um, yeah, it herds them back when they're when it's appropriate to do so. Um, and it's really awesome that they have so many motion sensors in the um, in the collars. And at this point, they're working on or have completed um, different sensor detections, I guess, um, so they can tell if the cow is walking or running or sleeping or ruminating or calving or limping or it's dead. And there's a bunch of other possible behaviors that they're working on tying together with the data. So this is one of the reasons that it's species specific right now, um, because as you can imagine, these motion sensors have um, numerical data that's output. And it takes hours of video observations of the animals and pairing that with that numerical output. So it just takes a lot of time on the development end to be able to appropriately pair that. So probably a lot of people have already started thinking about how could I even use this? Um, and there's tons of uses on a ranch system. Um, so one of the most obvious ways to use it is to protect sensitive areas. Like if you have a riparian habitat that you don't want the cows accessing at all times um, on the entire stream reach, that would be one way that you could use this. Or if you have like some bird nests, like for gunnison sage grouse that you know about and you want to protect those areas, you can fence them out of those. Um, Pasture subdivision is probably the most common use of this system. So if you have a big gigantic allotment with no internal fencing, then you can use this system to either do rotational grazing or strip grazing or any other number of um, grazing systems with this without having to build physical fences, which as Danny talked about, that's a huge issue for wildlife. Um, and there's tons of time and energy and money that's spent on maintenance and you could avoid it with this and if you're using temporary fencing like electric fencing you don't have to put that up and take it down all the time you don't have to use range riders to make sure they're not getting out of the fencing so it just eliminates a lot of of time and money and effort spent on physical barriers um, also because of those location sensors and the gps data that comes from these collars um, you always know where your cows are and what they're doing, which obviously would be a huge benefit for especially certain times of year, um, but it's just a really handy tool. You can also use that data to see if cattle are concentrated in certain areas. So if they're always in one spot, there might be some overutilization and some degradation in that area. So you might be able to use this system to fence them out of that temporarily and let that spot recover a little bit. So that's another way you could use it. Um, tying into the, the water hemlock, if you know that there's a patch of it somewhere, you could just fence them out of there. That would be another use of this without having to put up that physical barrier. Um, another thing that this is kind of advertised 
to do um, is to reduce water quality concerns. So if you have an area that's got really good forage but really wet soils, you might have cows coming through there and causing some hoof, she hoof shearing and some hummocking. Um, and so you could fence them out of that area, especially while the soils are wet and then let them flash graze it later on in the season. So tons and tons of applications. I'm sure there's many more that we haven't even talked about or thought about, but that's just a brief idea. Um, so the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on was um, why this technology would be important in Gunnison specifically, aside from all of those other reasons that I just talked about. So. One of the great things about it is that it can be used to increase your product productivity on the landscape um, by implementing those grazing systems. So you might be leaving more grass and more forage for wildlife, which is always nice. <laughs> um, another big project that's been going on for the last seven years or so is the Wet Meadow Restoration and Resilience Building Project, which is facilitated through the Gunnison Climate Working Group. Some of you guys might be familiar with this, but it's basically um, very um, low input. Like It's basically a, a structure made of rocks that holds more water in an uh, ephemeral stream. So it increases the water table in that area there's greater soil saturation and it improves the wetland species cover and diversity in that ephemeral stream reach. Um, so this makes really, really great forage. Um, there's lots of increased use by cattle and wildlife. And again, it has those wet soils and so there can be some hummocking and that can cause damage to those structures which makes them less effective overall. So you could use this fencing system to um, keep the cattle off of it for the times when there's really saturated soils. Um, also in the Gunnison Basin, I'm sure you all have been here long enough to notice that recreation is um, pretty large these days and there's a lot of people out. Um, if someone was grazing in an allotment that has high recreation pressure, they can use this system to reduce that conflict by keeping the cattle out of the high use areas during the peak times, but they could still use those areas when it's not the peak time, like a Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever, um, when they feel like there's less pressure there. Um, and that's also good for the cattle too, because it reduces their chronic stress levels, which obviously would be beneficial. Um, and the final reason to work in Gunnison with this system is the excellent partners that we have. Um, a lot of the agencies and the private landowners in this valley are fantastic to work together, and um, it's a really good, good effort that a lot of people can have input on. So just one more shout out to all of our excellent partners there. So I think that is all I had. So if you guys have time for questions now, or? We, we can take one or two. Our okay. next speaker is not coming, so. Okay. So Too much time. Know, we've got two minutes. <laughs> Okay. Okay, virtual fencing, they come to a boundary and they're supposed to stay on that side of it. Let's say they got run across real fast. When they come back to that boundary, are they going to be able to go back or is it going to go, oh, I can't go back over with my buddies again? Good question. It's a single direction fence. Yeah, so if, if this is the boundary right here and I cross through it, um, I will have received an electrical sorry. I will have received an electrical stimulus from crossing that, but say I'm panicked and I didn't, so I come all the way over here. It will give the audio tone, which I will hopefully stop at that point. But if I don't, um, I take one more step. Now that I'm calm, I'll receive that tone and the stimulus. I'll most cows apparently will turn right around, um, or they'll change direction or whatnot. They'll at least stop moving. Um, and it will continue to give me a tone like if I am still not moving back towards the boundary. And so as soon as I come back this way, then it won't give that tone or the stimulus and I can cross back in. And then if, of course, if I turn, it does the same thing again. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. What's, what's the cost? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, of course, it would depend on what company you're working with. Um, and the collars themselves are not terribly expensive, but again, this is all really developmental, so it's hard to say what the final cost will end up being. Um, the cost per collar is about $200, a little bit more than that, but not much. Um, it's the software system that they use that 
really increases that cost. I believe the base stations are 1,500 or so. Um, so the startup fee is fairly significant depending on how large your herd is. Um, but that's why it's so wonderful that we have so many partners and so much interest in funding this kind of stuff. So, yep. So uh, using <clears throat> multiple base stations, can this be programmed as form a mosaic map rather than just simply distance from the base station? Do you see what I'm getting at? I think so. So. Yeah, you could have, if you have like a really hilly terrain, um, you could have one up high and then you could have one down by the water trough and or water of whatever type. And anyway, you can have them arranged in certain ways so that they're always coming um, within reach of one of them. There's, they're also working on developing a, kind of a mobile base station. So say you're, and again, this is all based on which company you would work with and that kind of thing. But they're working on developing something where um, if your cows are moving, say, up in elevation as the season progresses, then you might have something that sits in the back of a wagon that you can pull, or a trailer that you can pull up the hill as they move up the hill. So yeah, there's lots of development, but you can have kind of a network of base stations. So your base station has to move up the mountain with the cattle? Not necessarily. It just depends on where it's placed and what kind of coverage it gets. How far so, away from the base station can your cattle be? I would have to check back with the company, and, and I'm not sure off the top of my head what that is. I think ideally you're trying to put it in an area where it's going to cover the general area, but obviously in Gunnison that's, that's the question, and that's why we're a test area because of this, <laughs> this topography that we have here. <laughs> um, but if you can put it somewhere that you know the cattle are going to come, that's a really key thing. So if you do have limited water sources, that's a fantastic way to make sure that the cattle are going to come in, in range of the base station. We have limited water sources, but we have limited access to yeah. computer. <laughs> yeah. So that's um, the thing that's really awesome about this is that the base stations have to have cellular or even satellite service, which a lot of Gunnison does have at least satellite. Yep, so as long as you have a computer at your house, you don't even have to bring it in the field. Um, it can download that data from your house. Or come to the extension office. Yeah, <laughs> or the library or... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's lots of different options. <laughs> Any other questions? It, it does go like several miles. Yeah, it's far. I just don't know the number off the top of my head. So. Exactly. It was seven miles. Ten, miles. Ten miles or something like that. So you put it on, yeah, on. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the great thing about it too is you would have that GPS collar location. So if you know that it's traveling, you'd see where it was. <laughs> it cost for over a thousand dollars. If you have a thousand head of cattle, that costs them astronomical. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of people can afford that. Yeah, and that's why there's a lot of partners that are working together on this. So we'll get government. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if anyone's interested, you can totally come talk to me about that opportunity.